Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. You may recall a couple of years ago we started a series on the Trans Am Triton. This is a 1978 build at home single board home computer. The series started with a history of the machine, I'm showing you it here for a quick recap, how the machine was offered through the ETI magazine and the various option packs that you could have. We then moved on to take a look at the machine I have here on the bench. This machine belongs to my dad, he gave me it to try and get it up and running again and I've been slowly working at it ever since. In part 2 of the video we checked out the power circuit, measured our AC voltages and we replaced the big capacitors and tested that we were getting the right DC voltages. We also had a brief tour of the entire board. Moving on to part 3. We wanted to check our memory chips were working so we used this as an excuse to build an SRAM tester using an Arduino. And finally in part 4 so far we wanted to read the contents of our ROM chips. There are a bunch of ROM chips on this board and actually they all seem to be pretty much tip top. No issues there, they were all working and what came out of them was almost perfect. There was just one bit wrong in our graphical character ROM here we can see in the top right but we're not going to let that stop us. And finally we reassembled the entire board with the hope of booting it up in part 5. We did have two dead RAM chips after our RAM testing and we had one logic chip which had lost a leg, this one here. So we need to replace that and we should be okay to try and boot up. That's where we're going to start today. So here we go, the suspense must be killing you, it's time to try and get this thing up and running. It's been kept safe and sound in the cupboard, it's not got any more dusty and everything seems to be as we left it. Here's our board and before I plug it in I wanted to check over the power circuit once more because I know that this voltage regulator on the back wasn't really soldered in very well and in fact one of the cables has detached itself. So we're going to rework this before we go any further because this looks really dodgy. The first thing we need to do then is completely remove it, this way we'll be able to clean everything and reapply some thermal paste and just generally do a good job. I'm finding that this bottom bolt was absolutely seized on, the nut on the other side is going to need a socket on it, the top one however I was able to remove with the screwdriver. There's our first one out and bringing in the trusty Halford socket set which has only exploded once so far, we'll remove the bottom one. The regulator can come out now, just notice the date code on it, 1977, cool, and it's still working perfectly. I'm going to need to desolder the final wire so this can uh, be removed from the case and we can clean it up. There it goes, I don't suppose that thermal paste is doing anything anymore, let's clean everything up. And in doing so the entire heatsink fell off and I realised I needed some more thermal paste. So let's clean all this off and then take a look at the heatsink. Let's pour a bit of alcoholic spirit on here and clean all of this dried up old thermal compound off and we can replace it with some really good stuff I've got here I actually bought for replacing the CPU in my computer so it should be pretty good for the job. We also need to clean the back of the voltage regulator itself so let's do that. I want to cut this back a little bit to expose a bit more wire so I can do a good job soldering. I'm a bit concerned that this is going to be getting very close to the chassis so I'm being very careful only to take off a few millimetres. That should be enough, I'm just going to have to put some heat shrink around once I've made the joints. So let's get this arctic thermal compound on. I'm realising I don't have very much so I'm going to have to use it sparingly and just sort of smoosh it around like this to try and get it to spread around. That should do. Oh dear I'm really on the dregs of this, uh, this thermal compound but that should just about do it and I'm going to have to buy some more now. Let's get our regulator back in place.
And check this out, I'm actually remembering to put the heat shrink on before I start soldering. That must be a first. Okay, not really sure how to do this and do a great job of it. I've just put a load of excess solder on the ends of this wire and I'm going to try and heat everything up and get a strong joint so when I give it a good tug, it doesn't feel like it's going to detach and I can still get the heat shrink around it. That's about as good as I think I'm going to manage. You can see how close we are to the chassis there, so I've managed to tuck the heat shrink into the holes in the chassis, which means I think we should be fairly well insulated. And now we just need to put this earth strap back on and we should be good to go. Now I'm dying to turn it on, but first of all, we need to replace the logic chip, which has lost a leg and figure out what's happening with this RAM. If you recall from part four of the video, this, I think it's a 74LS240 chip has lost a leg, but that's okay because I've bought some extra ones. And as for our RAM, well, in our RAM test video, we found that two RAM chips weren't working and I've left those out, but I know I haven't put them in in the correct order. So we're gonna have to figure that out as we go. For now, I've just left these two sockets empty. This is where our logic chip lives or lived. And luckily I seem to have bought two replacements at some point over the last year or two. So we can drop one of these in and that problem should be resolved. And I was just about to power up and I realized the board was just sitting on the chassis. Uh, no risers in place, so that's not the best. Uh, so I took them out, I still kept the ones that came out of the case thankfully. There we go. And now we can plug in our aerial cable, coax cable, and we should be able to power up. We've tested the power supply already, we know the voltages are there, so let's give it a go. Wow, it worked! I would not have bet that it would have worked first time. Well, here we are. We better plug the keyboard in quickly and see what happens when we press yes. And yeah, there's all our functions that we saw in the manual when we were going through everything in video one. Fantastic. Maybe we can make a short hello world program. Let's see what happens. Ah, it just says sorry. And sorry isn't the most useful error code in the world, but from the manual, it means that there's not enough memory. So we have a problem with our RAM. Thankfully, our monitor allows us to read out the value of every address location in RAM. Starting from zero, here we are, I can read all of this stuff. Although actually, this isn't RAM, this is coming from one of the ROM chips. So what we need to do is figure out which address is the start of RAM. Thankfully, the schematics help us with this. Here's a RAM schematic, and we can highlight down here, address 1400 to 14FF, corresponds to ICs 25 and 26. As we know, the RAM comes in pairs. Each RAM chip is four bits, so a pair of RAM chips makes up eight bits, one byte of data. And each pair holds 256 bytes all the way through to ICs 47 and 48. This pair corresponds to 1F00 to 1FFF. And we can see all this listed out in another schematic within the manual. It really is a brilliant manual, they don't make them like this anymore. And this is going to help us greatly in figuring out what's going on with our RAM issues. So you see we can use the L function to list the contents of the memory starting from location 1400. And here we are, this is the data that's occupying our first pair of RAM chips at this moment in time. And here's what I did to use this to help our investigation. I can write in, using the monitor, a value to each of these locations. So here I'm writing FF into every single address within a pair of RAM chips starting from 1600. And then I can read it back and I can see that FF has indeed gone in. And I can repeat the process writing in 00. These are all tricks learned from working on the speckies. And we should get 00 when we read it back. But in this case, we were getting F0, so I think we found a bad memory location, which is really handy. We can remove those chips and replace them with two other ones and see if we get any further. So for now, I've only occupied 1k of memory, and this is arranged as you can see here. 
It starts from the middle, there's three pairs in the middle, and then a fourth pair on the outside on the bottom. I could swear I did this right, but I was getting all kinds of problems until I turned the manual upside down and realized that I was looking at it all back to front. So I need to move two of these RAM chips, this outside pair, up to the top row, and then we should have 1K of memory. So let's try our two-line Hello World program again. Once I get the syntax right, we can see that it actually works, which means we have a working 1K Transam Triton. Hooray! Although I do have an issue with this NAF picture that we're getting, so I've bodged in a quick and dirty composite mod, and thanks Ian for this trick, I've put another resistor in parallel with this one here in order to boost the output. And now look, we have a lovely crisp composite video signal. Fantastic. I did get in a bit of a spin with the memory there, so I'm going to retest all the memory. And now I have a working machine, I'm not going to use the Arduino. I'm just going to put a ZIF socket in here and then test this memory location corresponding to the pair of chips on the outside of the top row, as I did before. And I can figure out how many RAM chips are working and hopefully get the machine up to a working 2K of memory. And here's the result. I did manage to get 16 working memory chips. Here they are in their pairs, and this corresponds to 2K of RAM. So we have a Transom Triton with 2K of memory. These are the four other working chips I have. I'm going to need another four to replace the other knackered four. Anyway, we'll do that later. Let's do something a bit more fun. Here is Computing Today from December 1980, in which there's a listing for a fruit machine game which you can program in to level seven Triton Basic. Well, we don't have level 7 basic, so I think we're going to have to do a bit of rewriting, but let's type it in anyway and see how we get on. Okay, fingers crossed, here we go, let's try and run it. And, oh, line 1, we have an error. This is just a syntax error, so the colon there is the wrong kind of colon before CLS. This seems to be a theme, there's a lot of small changes to the syntax between basic 5.1 and 7, but I got there in the end, just about got it running, with the aid of the magical list function, which I learned about way too late, which actually prints back my code that I've written in. Thank God for that. And here's the program running. Finally, after rewriting everything for basic 5.1 and putting in a few improvements of my own. We lost that round, but this round we're going to win. Here we are, three arrows pointing in the right direction. That's a jackpot. Means I've won 15 and the house is down 15. I should quit now while I'm ahead. One last thing I want to do to sew this all up nicely. Remember when we read the contents of the graphics ROM chip, we found one bit out of place. Up here in the top right, it's this kind of diagonal line. Let's have a look on our machine now. Yeah, there's our missing bit. I don't see the extra bit which we seem to have read out. I'm not sure why that's not there, but it's nice to see that we had read it out correctly and there's our one bad bit in all of our ROM chips. Lovely. So who else out there has got a Transam Triton? I've got a few more subscribers now. Comment below if you do and come join us on the Facebook group if you haven't already. Well, that's about it. Thanks for watching and hopefully part 6 will arrive at some point in the future.